let's talk about these really disgusting bugs. Uh, this is the spotted lanternfly, an invasive species from Asia that has made its way to the East Coast and is um, pretty much eating everything in sight. Uh, it is a prolific um, eater of crops. Uh, it is a pretty prolific breeder and is a pretty hardy um, bug. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times, or possibly the Wall Street Journal, possibly both, um, talking about how the spotted lanternfly is the most devastating species in 150 years, potentially. Um, it has multiple established populations on the East Coast. Um, and as I was saying earlier, it eats practically everything, uh, including... Uh, what made me sit up and take notice, grapes and hops, which leads to wine and beer. Suddenly I was very interested in what was going on with this bug, um, as well as uh, hardwoods and lots of other crops. I, I believe I saw on one of the training uh, webinars or courses that, uh, that I've sat through that it was almost a shorter list of what it didn't eat than what it did. Um, and... As we met, as I mentioned, it's it's a voracious eater. There's um, been reports of 90% uh, crop losses reported. But you didn't come here to listen to me talk about this. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Dana Rhodes. She is with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Uh, Pennsylvania has been on the, uh, I guess, the spear point of of uh, stopping uh, this bug and this infestation. And uh, Dana has really been uh, kind of the uh, one of the point people for the trucking regula uh, regulation with it. Um, Dana is the, a plant, the, excuse me, a plant health program manager and is a uh, state plant regulatory official or a SPRO. Uh, she has uh, 27 years horticultural experience uh, 10 of which has been uh, with the Department of Agriculture with regulatory responsibilities. Uh, her work with the Department of Agriculture currently includes quarantine pest issues, nursery and greenhouse certification programs, and inspections. And uh, I, Dana believes that to control and contain pest issues, it takes industry and regulatory programs working together. Uh, and that it is important for each side to understand how each other operates and why the pest poses a threat. So, Dana, thank you for joining us today. Well, Tom, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to share information uh, with the industry, and I also appreciate the fact that people are willing to teach me more about the trucking world. Um, it, it is not something I'm that familiar with, so I do appreciate you sharing your knowledge with me. Outstanding. Well, before we get started, we one of the things that we talked about was that we wanted to find a, out a little bit about where everybody is um, in the, I guess, on, on the spectrum of knowing about the spotted lanternfly and doing some of the training and whatnot. So we came up with a really quick little poll. So we would like everybody to answer the question here, um, asking, has someone in your company already taken the Penn State course yet? So if everybody could go ahead and click in and give us our answers and find out uh, where we are with this. Looks like we've got most everybody answering. Give it just another couple of seconds. So we just want everybody to go ahead and click and answer. Uh, has someone in your company already taken uh, this course. All right, so we're at about 90 some odd percent. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And you can see Dana here, it looks like about uh, three quarters of our attendees, nobody from their company has taken this. So this is a great opportunity for you to be able to reach out and uh, educate everybody about what's going on so we can sort of tailor our questions and answers to this. Great. All right, so um, what we wanted to do was make this sort of a uh, 
a question and answer, more of a conversation. We find that people are able to sort of follow along a little bit better that they're not trying to read and listen and watch things at the same time. So uh, we're going to make this sort of more of a conversation. And uh, like I said, if people have questions, go ahead and put them in that question tab and we will tackle those at the end. So um, let's start with the the first question, Dana. Why is the spotted lanternfly such a threat? Well, the main reason that we looked at this is we were the first state um, in the United States and actually in the Western Hemisphere to identify this pest. Um, and it goes to multiple things. We know that it will feed on about 50 to 60 different species of plant material. Uh, so we have the threat there, as Tom mentioned, to grapes and to hops, um, and then to our hardwoods interest industry. And in Pennsylvania, we are the number one exporter in uh, hardwoods for the nation, and that's a uh, $16 billion industry for us. So certainly anytime something is threatening, um, we, we want to take a look at that. But then as we have learned more and have experienced more about the past, it's not just about the crop losses, which could be major, but it's also about the people who have to live in the infestation. This is not a pleasant uh, insect. It secretes what we refer to as honeydew, and I can tell you that it is. there's nothing sweet about it whatsoever. Um, it's a sugary substance um, that is excreted by the insect after they feed, and if they're in the treetops and you have a, a vast population, the honeydew rains down on people. It, it's like rain falling, and so you get that sugary substance over anything that's sitting outside. And when you think about the summer months and you like to be out on your patio um, and just having those cookouts and enjoying uh, the family outside, you can't do it where there are high populations um, because it covers you, covers your deck. People are having to clean their patios and decks, uh, power washing them multiple times. And we're not sure what kind of uh, economic impact that's going to have on the housing industry because certainly if it's in the summer and you want to sell your house, nobody's going to want to buy it. Um, with all the honeydew that could be coming down on you. Wow, that's really uh, gross. Oh, so you mentioned, obviously, you're with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, but the um, the spotted lanternfly is not just in Pennsylvania. They don't they don't really recognize our borders, do they? No, uh, they they don't know what state lines are or uh, county lines. So they are just looking for the next food source and the next. Uh, Place where they can establish themselves. Uh, their their main goal is to procreate, so that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the where they've been found, and um, you know, there, there's and sort of what the difference is between sort of when there's a known population, what a quarantine is, when they where they've been spotted. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means, sort of from a regulatory standpoint? Sure. Um, the map that you see right now, you'll see the yellow, and uh, that is where we know that there are populations. And Pennsylvania has put up an internal and an external quarantine. And what that means is uh, people who reside in Pennsylvania within that yellow area are restricted in their movement by needing to do inspection work. We want to make sure that we're safeguarding product and conveyances before they come out of the quarantine because we don't want to spread it to the rest of the state. Uh, New Jersey is also, they have an, ex, um, an internal quarantine on their three counties. And then um, Virginia does not have a quarantine, but because they have a known population, uh, they are required by Pennsylvania's quarantine and New Jersey's quarantine to make sure that before they come into another state that has a quarantine, uh, that they have the proper permits uh, to do business because uh, Pennsylvania has it only in the southeast area. We don't want a population from another state going to areas where we don't have it. So that's what some of the quarantines mean. New York has an external quarantine um, on any state that has a known population. So New York is essentially quarantining Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia. And I can tell you that Delaware has also got a population that's been identified. 
So they also are under the New York quarantine, and their quarantine specifically states that um, you must have a permit or certification of some kind from the shipping state saying uh, that you have a load that is free from uh, spotted lanternfly. So uh, we, you're, we're talking a little bit about you know these quarantines and, and how the permits are, are going to work, but that's not the only way that the states are coordinating to attack this problem. There's, there's more than just, you know, putting, setting up quarantines and doing inspections. There's, um, obviously this is why ITI is, uh, you know, participating in this. There's, there's also sort of, uh, regulations around training and awareness. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the states recognize that really the best way we can approach um, trying to prevent the movement of spotted lanternfly is to provide education, uh, to raise the awareness of people who are living in the quarantine and also those that are doing business in and out of the quarantine. So we work, uh, we talk to each other on a regular basis. Every two weeks we're communicating. And right now we are trying to come to an agreement on a regional approach to spotted lanternfly. And we really think that this would be beneficial, especially to businesses, because we would agree on a training module that any business in any state could take um, and then be tested on to have a permit or certificate, whatever the state may want to call it, which would allow them to move into other states. Essentially, we would look at a uh, reciprocity. So if you get it in one state, another state's going to recognize it and allow you to continue trade. So we are working together to find a solution that is going to be easier for uh, the general public to understand as well as businesses to be able to continue trade. Okay. Uh, let's see. So we had, we were talking about this. So we we're, uh, this was just a, a slide. And by the way, I've, I'm going to be making this presentation available um, also afterwards. Uh, just so that uh, if you need to uh, show this to everybody else's, you know, the companies who are attending today, if you need to show this to your management team to talk about why this is. Um, several counties in Pennsylvania, Jersey, Virginia, Maryland, Connecticut, New York have found the bugs. Uh, we have quarantines in place and we're expecting another one from uh, Delaware, uh, likely in 2019. Um, but, you know, and then we're talking about um, training and awareness for fleets and warehouse employees, which sort of leads to the next question. Why is trucking such a major risk pathway? What is it about the the trucking industry that that makes it I guess you know sort of a risk vector like um, you know why isn't uh, how how is it that trucking has been identified as the as one of the areas that can help defend the economy from this bug? Well, um, the insect in itself is not a strong flyer, so it really depends on people to move it around wherever it's going to get to. So any any vehicle. Uh, that can possibly move the insect is considered a risk. Um, even for the people who live within the quarantine area, um, you know, personal vehicles, they too have to do an inspection on a regular basis. So we're not just saying that trucking is a pathway, we're saying all vehicles, all conveyances are a pathway. Um, adults and then their eggs that are laid by the adults um, look like a smear of mud, and they contain about 30 to 50 eggs, and they'll lay on anything. They're much like gypsy moths. So if any of you have experience with doing inspections for gypsy moth, this insect, um, as far as their eggs um, go, would be very similar to that. So you're doing an inspection to remove any living life stage, any adult, or uh, the egg mass before you might move out especially given that, you know, you're in and out of areas and some of the areas within the quarantine have a lot of different trees in them, especially the tree of heaven, uh, parking under tree lines. Um, so thinking about um, industrial parks, Alanthus trees or tree of heaven will grow in soil that's been recently disturbed, which a lot of the industrial parks have around them. 
So it just raises each one of those elements start raising the risk associated with trucking. Um, but I, I have to say that with all the people that I have met in the industry and that I have been working with, I, I truly appreciate the engagement that the industry has offered to regulatory um, in wanting to be a part of the solution. So uh, which you mentioned, you know, sort of these industrial parks and whatnot, but we've also talked about, you know, that they um, that these insects, um, you know, they feed on a lot of different agricultural products. They feed on um, a lot of the forestry products. Um, does that mean only if you're carrying, um, you know, uh, food, agricultural products, forestry products that your fleet is subject to these rules or or I guess the broader question is which fleets are going to be subject to these uh, rules that we're going to be talking about with the permitting and whatnot? Any fleet that, that goes into a quarantine area are subject to the rules. Uh, so if you are going, uh, if you're a local fleet and you're only moving within the quarantine, you still have to have a permit because in Pennsylvania, because um, we have areas there where we have very low populations to no populations, and then we have some areas that are very high. And we don't want to move those populations around, especially when we're working on eradication, because if we get an area under control, we don't want to repopulate it. And then certainly if you are coming in to pick up loads and then move them back out um, to other parts of Pennsylvania or even across the nation, uh, you are carrying a threat if you're carrying an adult, a pregnant female, or even egg masses, because one egg mass with 30 to 50 eggs is enough to start a new population somewhere. So that's why all fleets coming into that quarantine area need to have that permit. And there was, um, oops, let's see. Um, one of the th questions that we had gotten, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more, is there's this sort of exception for stopping for normal traffic. Um, and fuel stops and rest stops and things like that. Does that, does that, um, you know, should should we breathe a sigh of relief if we think we're 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 not really stopping and picking up there, or do, do things like fuel stops and rest stops should that should that matter to us as a fleet if uh, if we're you know mostly just passing through? A fuel stop, um, especially if the insect is not very active, certainly this time of year when it's very cold, uh, we don't see them, um, and the adults are dead at this point, but the egg masses are still living. Um, but you know, now you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be so concerned about fuel stops or even a rest stop. However, uh, when they hatch, which is mid-May. Um, into they, they don't die until a hard freeze, so usually late November. Uh, those are concerning, um, even for rest stops, because the longer you sit in an area, the more chances you have of picking up a hitchhiker, um, especially if you're parking under tree lines. Um, we don't recommend that you roll your windows down because they will fly into the cab with you. Uh, we've had reports of that and actually have seen it. Um, if you have the cargo doors open on your truck, they're going to fly in the back. Um, so you have to be very careful how you're um, looking as you're fueling. If you see a lot of insects swarming around you, uh, take precautions. Uh, make sure that you're not carrying something with you as you move out. And then, as I mentioned, with rest stops, you know, if, if you're there more than for a few minutes, please do another inspection before you get back on the road we would consider that a hazard. Yeah. So, you know, basically everybody needs to be trained on it and be aware of it and truly think about the permit um, and going ahead and, and getting that training and permit. Okay. So uh, this seems like a good time to um, launch our next poll that we would like all of our uh, um, viewers to take part in. Um, what we want to know is how often are your vehicles moving into the Spotted Lanternfly quarantine areas? Um, so we'd love everybody to go ahead and uh, go ahead and click, choose one of our options here, uh, daily, weekly, monthly, or some other version, which is sort of occasionally. Uh, we're looking to find out from, 
from you, our participants, about how often uh, your vehicles are moving in and out. So if everybody could take a quick moment and vote or uh, let us know, we're, we're curious to know how often it, and uh, looks like we're getting up to about uh, most of our people voting. So I'll give it another, just another couple of seconds here. And um, all right, great. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, all right, if anybody's got their mouse hovering over it, now's the time. I'm gonna go ahead and close this and share the results. It looks like the vast majority of our participants today are, I mean, three quarters of them are there daily and weekly uh, with the remainder there sort of on a less predictable occasionally, uh, uh, I guess, frequency. So good to know that um, people are really taking this seriously. So um, next question, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, why is training, especially for, for fleets, why is training and awareness the right solution to, to this uh, stopping this pest right now? Well, by training, uh, we are raising awareness. We're telling people what to look for and when to look for it um, so that they can be proactive. Um, and as they are going around, you know, my understanding is many of the fleets require uh, a safety inspection um, before you get on the road. So, you know, by training people what to look for for spotted lanternfly, we're adding one more line that we're asking you to inspect for before you get back in the truck and, and get on the road. And we just feel like by raising the awareness, not only of management, um, but of all employees, the truckers, the warehouse workers, um, you know, the guys that are, are uh, driving the skidsters to load and unload, uh, that really assist everybody in just taking that extra few Um, and that's really where we need the most help um, in, in being able to manage and not spread this insect around. Fantastic. So uh, let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, can you describe for us what the train, the, the sort of the, the two step process of the training and permitting process uh, for the four fleets that are operating in this area? Certainly. Um, for Pennsylvania, uh, we have worked very closely with Penn State um, University um, because they do many online trainings for different classes. They developed an online course for the permit system. Um, and we feel like that um, they are providing a great deal of information to everybody. And it's also designed so that um, we all learn in different ways. Some people like to read material. Some people like to listen to it. So you have both options. Uh, it's also done by chapters. So it's um, this moment where you can go in, you can start the, the training, and if something comes up, you can put it down and come back to you, come back to it. You're not going to lose your spot. You're not going to lose um, any work that you've already completed. Uh, so that, that gives you the flexibility that you need um, to be able to move it forward. Generally, the training course is going to take you about um, anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes. Uh, that's what I'm getting back from, from people who have gone through the training course. And also, you know, we realize that, you know, we are asking supervisors, managers, or owners to be the ones who go through the training course. And as you go through the system, uh, you're going to receive information that you can then use for training your employees. Um, all employees uh, that are going to be subject to coming across a spotted lanternfly. So we're providing the training materials to you as you go. And then also with each chapter, you're going to be asked questions throughout uh, the chapter. And that's actually your exam. So it's not like you have to memorize a lot of material and then wait um, to the very end to take the test. You're taking it as you go. Uh, so we feel like it's a user-friendly system and certainly uh, much less cumbersome than some of the other programs that we have had to put in place um, for getting people to be in compliance. Yeah. So, and I'll just uh, sort of hop in here too. So um, one of the things that uh, we've 
explain this to a number of people over the phone and whatnot with our own clients is that getting the permit is is as Dana said it's a it's a two step process. Uh, it's good to know that it's actually a much shorter course than the two hours that um, it take took some of our people to get through it. But um, the essentially what happens is that first step is that uh, the manager takes the state course, and this is this is the longer course that Dana is referring to that's uh, done through the Penn State um, online course. Um, and it sounds like they're doing a, a lot of very similar things to the way that ITI does it, which is it's mastery based, which is you're being quizzed on things as you go um, rather than having to wait toward the end. Um, and the fact that it's using a lot of uh, different modalities, uh, hearing things, seeing things, watching things, um, uh, reading as well. Um, so then once that course is done, that manager is going to order the, the permits or hang tags needed. And then the idea is that the manager has uh, some of these, you know, print materials or whatnot that they can download and print out. And then they can use to print the drive, print and uh, train the uh, all your drivers and warehouse employees. Or the other option is that um, you can then uh, use um, our ITI's Spotted Lantern Fly course, which is designed specifically for the drivers and the warehouse workers. This is not a replacement for the Penn State uh, course, for the manager course. This is exclusively for the drivers and the warehouse workers. Um, the online course is about 10 minutes. And uh, once you assign that to all the people that are uh, impacted, uh, that manager can check the completion in Centix, um, which is our LMS or if you're using ProTread uh, Legacy, um, same thing, basically the LMS that we have, and you'll be able to issue the permit. So what we've done is basically provide a way where if you have a large population of drivers and warehouse workers that you need to do this, uh, doing in-person training may not be terribly efficient. You may be uh, sort of in multiple uh, distribution centers and warehouses. Um, it could be that they're in a different region, even from you are if you're a national company. Uh, this makes it a little bit easier. Um, obviously, with Centix, you have the ability to assign um, courses to different groups, um, and we can make that really easy for you. Our client services group is um, can make that. Uh, we can even do the assignments for you uh, as long as you uh, know which of your employees are going to be impacted by that. So that is the extent of the selling we're going to do today. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think we've talked a little bit about how, oh wait, actually I had another poll. Last poll, everybody. Um, and I'm going to guess the answer that I already know the vast answer to this, which is, um, have you already begun training your drivers and employees? Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and guess that the vast majority here is going to be no considering uh, most everybody hadn't taken the manager course yet. So everybody wants to go ahead and uh, go ahead and click a vote. Yes. Looks like we're at about where we've been in the past. So I'm going to go ahead and close that and share the results. And as predicted, uh, looks like most everybody has not yet begun training their drivers and employees. Um, and uh, I suppose the, as you said, Dana, the, the semi good news with that is that uh, all the adult uh, insects are are dead at the moment, and we're it, we're in the egg season. So it seems like now is a great time to get started on this whole process. Absolutely, Tom. Uh, now is a good time to go through the training, uh, get everybody else trained, and if you have been in the quarantine area, especially if you have parked those uh, trucks anywhere. Uh, do a thorough inspection, um, clean off anything that uh, looks like dried on, caked on mud, because uh, that's what the egg masses look like at this point. And, you know, if you clean the equipment after the adults de are dead, uh, you're pretty much free to move um, around the area uh, without having to do uh, too many inspections because you're done and they're not going to be active again until uh, late April, mid-May. So you've talked a little bit about yeah, just, this. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to add about uh, the enforcement uh, coordinating uh, with other states. Uh, th that is one thing we, we are trying to also uh, talk to each other about how we're each doing it and learning more about how all the other states are working 
um, on their approach for enforcement. Um, I know that New York State has been doing some roadside inspections. Um, that is something that they have done for years, just part of their uh, nursery program, uh, looking for plant material coming in. So um, just adding spotted lanternfly to an effort that they already had in place seemed very natural for them to do. And I will tell you that um, if you don't have a permit or you haven't had a permit, they may have issued what they refer to as a notice of rejection uh, that puts you in their database so that they can monitor uh, how many times you might have come through their state without that permit. Um, and it, there may be a moment where it's not a notice of a rejection, but it is, please don't come into New York um, because they are very serious about this insect and not wanting it to become established in their state. Uh, so they are taking it seriously. And I do caution you, if you're traveling there, please get the permit uh, system. They do recognize Pennsylvania's permit system. Uh, they've seen our certificates, and uh, they have gone through our training our, themselves, and they like it. Uh, so they have agreed to our permit system being acceptable in New York. I will also say that in um, Pennsylvania, we are um, hiring a, a team that will be uh, solely in charge of compliance and enforcement. And we too will be doing roadside inspections once that team is in place um, and it's warmer weather. Uh, so do look for Pennsylvania to also be taking some enforcement uh, and verification. We want to make, we want you in compliance and we want to help you get there. And there you have, uh, there's a, there's a list that I mean that, that you guys maintain of all the companies that have gone through and done the Penn State course. And there's, there's an awareness angle that's going on there too, right? It's, it's your company's opportunity to say that, you know, we're not going to be the ones responsible for, for this bug spreading. Absolutely. Um, you know, the community frequently is calling us wanting to know, well, how do I know who to choose? How do I know who to get to move my stuff for me? And we, we refer them to uh, the permit participants page uh, where it does list everybody uh, who has gone through the permit program. And so it gives them confidence that uh, you're inspecting the material, uh, your conveyance before you move uh, their material. Also, businesses uh, within the quarantine area, uh, they want to make sure that whoever is transporting their loads can get it across state lines or get it through a checkpoint when they're coming through. They don't want their, their commodities turned around um, because, you know, the fleet uh, did not have the proper permit um, and paperwork. So please take that into consideration. Once your name's up there, it's free advertisement for you. Yeah. It won't cost you anything. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, you know, there's always that sort of carrot and stick. Let's just continue on with the stick while we're sort of on this topic. What are the fines and penalties that fleets who aren't in compliance, what are, what are they going to be facing? Uh, you, when we talked earlier, you'd mentioned it was sort of a matrix approach. It, it is a matrix approach and we're still working on what it will look like exactly for Pennsylvania. But um, much like when you have traffic violations, uh, the worse the violation, the worse the penalty is going to be associated with that violation. Or if you have repeat offenses, the fine is going to go up. Uh, we have within the quarantine, uh, we have criminal and civil penalties that can be imposed depending upon uh, what the violation is. Um, we also, you know, it can be three hundred dollars um, to twenty thousand dollars so you know that's not where we like to go uh, we certainly want to assist people in being compliant before we have to issue fines and penalties but there are moments when they are necessary so I'm gonna uh, back up one slide here real quick um, so what is it that drivers that you know we should be training these drivers to expect to see from shippers when they're picking up in the quarantine areas it's you know it's one thing to inspect your your tractor and if it's you know your owned trailer or you know something like that 
But what are the, you know, they're then putting these things into, uh, you know, the back of the drive van. Oh, what, what, what sort of paperwork or permits or whatnot um, should the drivers expect to see from the shippers when they're picking up from those quarantine areas? Uh, and what we have are uh, their certificate labels. And when a business has a compliance agreement or even some of the um, shippers in the quarantine area may have a permit, they're giving ta given tags that then can go on their invoices or bill of lading that are given to the drivers. Um, you need to make sure that you see that um, so that, you know, if you get stopped, I know that New York looks for them. Um, this is something that they have requested, so we have worked with them to find something that um, will give them an insurance that, you know, the trucking company may be hired by someone and we want to make sure that who hires them have also inspected whatever commodity they're shipping uh, before it's loaded on the truck, that they've safeguarded it and that we are sh as sure as we can be that nothing is inside that truck moving forward um, and that you have a safe load in the back of your truck. Great. All right, I think it's time for the lightning round with the with questions. So um, I have collected a number of questions uh, uh, from people beforehand. So I've got a few that are ready to go. But if uh, everybody wants to uh, go over to that questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel and type in some of those questions, we've already got a few in there, so I'll start with those. Uh, and one of the first questions is, uh, I think you talked a little bit about it, who is it that will be doing the roadside inspections in the various states? Um, I can only speak to Pennsylvania, but I can tell you that in Pennsylvania, uh, the Department of Agriculture, the Compliance and Enforcement Team will be working uh, directly with the uh, state troopers. Uh, the state troopers have some authority and Department of Agriculture has some authority, so we work together. Um, they have the um, authority over the vehicles themselves, and then we are the ones that are responsible for spotted lanternfly um, and doing the paperwork and permit inspection, um, as well as seeing if we are, find any living life stage on the truck. Uh, so we work in conjunction with each other. Uh, New York, I believe, also does that, and New York and Pennsylvania, to my knowledge, are the only ones that are doing roadside inspections. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to pop this up here real quick. So next question. Uh, will we need to get training from each of the quarantine states, or is it sufficient to get the training and certification from one state, i.e. Pennsylvania? You are so lucky right now because Pennsylvania is the only one with training. So you take our training and you're good to go in all states. Okay. That's great. Um, let's see. Next question. Um, and we talked a little bit about this. Um, what happens if a vehicle or load is found with the bugs or with egg masses? Um, will they be put out of service? Will they be barred entry into or exit from the quarantine area? And then sort of on a related note, what if the driver is close to their end of hours of service? Is, is this where sort of normal rules and procedures with hours of service and those sort of uh, rules uh, start to, to, to take place? It, it is. Um, so that's where the state troopers authority comes in. And so whatever would usually happen with um, out of hours service, uh, that is, is what's going to happen here. Uh, we certainly don't want to um, put anyone else in threat of breaking yet another rule. So we would just work with the state police on that so that it covers both. Um, as far as if you find an egg mass, if it can be removed and the inspector verifies that it's it's removed and done, uh, they would let you pass. Um, you know, if it's a dead insect, you're, we're going to let you pass. It's if it's alive. Um, so that's what we are very concerned about. So if there's a spot on your on your truck um, where you could, you know, the adults could get in there and just sit real nice and, and safe in there, and there's a whole bunch of them, 
you know, that would be a concern to us. Uh, we would want to do an intense inspection, especially if we know that the females are, are um, pregnant and, and laying egg masses. So it's going to cause you to slow down that much more um, because we're going to do a thorough inspection of the vehicle before it leaves. Yeah, delays, that's fun times. Um, yeah, we don't like that. <laughs> How effective is truck washing in, uh, uh, I guess, you know, washing off egg masses, uh, nymph, in, during the nymph stage and the adult stage? With the adults and the nymphs, I'm sure that they would come right off with a, with a wash. Um, they're, like I said, they're not strong swimmers. Um, I mean, I mean, strong flyers, sorry about that. So any, any quick movement is, probably going to zip them right off of there. Um, the egg masses, we are still waiting for uh, science to tell us um, if that's enough to, a good power washing is enough to disrupt an egg mass, um, but we do not have a final answer on that. Um, but, you know, it is something that we are looking into. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Next question it says, we are a postal contractor and we are not allowed to open a sealed trailer. How do we ensure the load is not contaminated? This sounds like sort of where you're talking about where the uh, shipper is going to be providing some sort of verification that uh, that the trailer is is free of of bugs. Well, and and we would need to make sure, especially on the postal side, that um, you know that's a federal agency. So we would be reaching out to them to make sure they're aware. But my advice is to ask questions. Uh, ask lots of questions. Uh, they certainly may be asking you questions. Uh, you know, ask them if they are aware of spotted lanternfly. Are they aware about the quarantine? Uh, get get some information from them. Uh, ask them if they safeguarded. Uh, how long was the the cargo doors open? Were they backed up um, and flush with the building while it was being loaded? Uh, so just just be informed. Just okay. just ask. Okay. Um... Here's a good question, and it's something we haven't, you know, sort of dived into specifically um, because it's it's going to be both in the Penn State course as well as in the uh, what you would train your drivers. Uh, what do you do if you find a bug or one of these egg masses? If you find a bug, squish it, just kill it. Uh, don't care how you. Well, I do care how you do it, um, but um, you know, just kill it. Uh, use a fly swatter. Um, if it's if you have been in the quarantine and you look over and it's sitting on the dash looking back at you, don't freak out. Just swat it. Um, that's what we're after is killing the insect and the egg mass, as I stated before. Scrape it off. Once you scrape it in a downward motion and squish as you do that, you can put um, a little hand sanitizer on it um, or you can put it on the, the, um, the ground and just uh, squish it with the toe of your, your boot. Um, just kill them. Okay. Yeah, there's, um, a, a, this is uh, part of the training that, training course that we have. It explains how all of that works. Um, the spotted lanternfly, not a stinger, not, is it's not going to hiss at me or anything, right? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, like people other than the fact they get a free ride off of us. Uh, they're not going to bite you. They're not going to suck the blood out of you. Uh, they really are only going to suck the sap out of the plants that they feed on, um, and they're not harmful to humans or to pets. Okay, great. Other than the, the honeydew being really, really gross. Uh, yeah, the, the honeydew is pretty nasty. All right. Uh, next question is asking about the Penn State online course. How do we find that manager training? There's Actually, if you go to uh, the website that I've got up there, the instructiontech.net slash lanternfly, we have a link to it. Um, down in the resources section, uh, it should be pretty easy. I'll make sure that I include that link when I send out the email of the webinar video. Uh, it's pretty easy to find it. If you Google it, um, it's you, I believe it's probably one of the top uh, results. At least it has been every time I've uh, gone through and Googled it. Uh, let's see, next question. Are there certain areas of the truck that are more likely to harbor the insects or the eggs? Great question. That is a very good question, and it's it's anything um, that's a nook or a cranny cranny that they can get into that they would be protected uh, from the wind from daring travel. Um, 
They like warm areas, especially if it's chilly or raining outside. They like to, to find an area that's particularly warm. If you have rust on your truck or um, anywhere what you're hauling, they are prone to like to lay egg masses on rusty spots. Uh, so another good area to, to look at um, when you're doing inspections. Great. Uh, next question. And actually, this is uh, some, uh, something I was kind of curious about. Are they killed by regular bug sprays? And uh, sort of my related question to that is, um, uh, what sorts of other things are the states looking at doing to eradicate this uh, pest? I mean, obviously, other than the training and awareness is good, boots can only boots and windshields can only kill so many of these. Are, are there other things that, you know, insecticides, uh, things like that, that um, people are looking at to, to kill these bugs? Absolutely. And on the Penn State webpage um, that you're going to provide the link to also on the same page for the training, uh, there's information uh, that you can look at. But the insect itself is very easy to kill. Um, and the state is and the, the feds are also uh, have a treatment program that we use. And we actually, for the state, we use the tree of heaven, uh, which is a tree that we know that they like to feed on. Uh, so we remove some of the tree of heaven and then we leave a couple. And the ones that we leave, we actually um, apply a systemic insecticide, which goes up and down the tree so that when the uh, spotted lanternfly feed on that tree, they're ingesting an insecticide, and it's very effective. Um, within a few moments, they're looking all groggy, and they're beginning to realize something's not right in the meal that they just took. And then in a little bit later, they fall down dead to the ground. Uh, there are contact sprays um, that you can buy over the counter that you can use on them. There are also the systemics that are available over the counter uh, at your local hardware store or garden center that you can use on them. So they are easy to kill themselves. Do, is it, uh, when you talk about the hardware and garden center, are there things that are specifically, I guess, mar marketed towards spotted lantern fly, or is it like a fly and wasp killer? What, what sort of thing should we, I mean, I guess from that perspective, what sort of thing would we be looking for there? Well, I can, I can tell you what Pennsylvania looks for according to the label. Uh, we are, uh, when you are using uh, pesticides, it is where are you using them? So if it's on a structure, if it's in a garden or uh, in a planter bed or even the right of ways, there are certain sprays that are designated for those areas. Uh, so uh, if it says it's going to kill a plant hopper and that's what uh, spotted lanternfly are and you can use it in your uh, vegetable garden then you can use that uh, to kill the spotted lantern fly. Um, there are not, to my knowledge yet, we don't have anything specifically for spotted lantern fly, so you won't see like an ant or wasp spray uh, for spotted lantern fly, but you can use it in the area uh, that you need to protect. Outstanding, great. Uh, let's see, that was the next question. Oh wait, um, if they, if a driver finds a bug or an egg mass and kill it, uh, are they required to report that or do they just move on with their life? <laughs> you, you, you need to make a note in your records uh, okay. that you're keeping that you found it and you took care of it. That's what we're after. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Um, great. So uh, do you have any recommendations or best practices for truck stops travel plazas or truck washes in the quarantined areas? My best advice is do not park under tree lines. Uh, stay away from them as much as you possibly can, especially uh, when you are uh, starting to look at the August, uh, month of August, because that's when they start laying their egg masses. So if you have pregnant females and they fall down on the truck, uh, you might get an egg mass laid on the truck at some point. So parking in an open area is preferable. Keeping your windows rolled up, um, especially if they are in what we refer to as a swarming, which is you'll see them flying all around. You want to keep your windows up and um, 
keep the cargo doors shut as quickly as possible after you get a load and just um, try and be aware of where they are and doing those inspections. Again, you might have done it right before you, um, before you got to where you're picking up your load, but take another look before you leave. Right. So uh, just doing those things would be very helpful. Right. I also want to mention, um, going back to the, if you find um, an egg mass or a spotted lanternfly, if you are out and about doing travels and you see it in an area that's not quarantined, we would ask that you report it. And again, you can use the Penn State website for that uh, reporting mechanism because the sooner we find an area where um, a spotted lanternfly is located, the sooner we can get a survey team in to determine if it's a new population or if it just got there uh, by happenstance, it, it hitchhiked with somebody. Um, and that does happen frequently. Uh, so uh, just just be aware, uh, we are looking at every uh, report of spotted lanternfly throughout Pennsylvania, and many and I can tell you, New York does the same. If they hear about a new uh, location, they're right on it, getting a team to go in and do intensive survey for that area. That's great. Uh, we all, we had a comment rather than a question. It was just a, a, a mention to be careful of what your uh, spray. If you're hauling food or drink, that's obviously a good point when it comes to a lot of the uh, uh, FISMA sorts of uh, uh, rules and regulations uh, having to do with food safety. Uh, let's see. Absolutely. Have, let's see. We have covered a lot of area. I'm just looking through some of my other questions. If anybody else has any other questions, they, now would be a great time to fill it out. We've gone through quite a few. Give me just a second here. Um, oh, uh, you mentioned, you'd mentioned earlier that, uh, May is around the time that they start to hatch and then August is around the time that they start to lay new eggs. Um, will flies hatch early if say they went from a cold, um, you know, an, an outdoor area where there was an egg mass and then they're kept indoors? Uh, will they hatch early if they're indoors and warm? And yes. then I guess related question, you know, if they're kept in a reefer or in a refrigerated area, are they going to stay in an egg mass if they're, if they stay refrigerated? Um, that That's a good question. Um, my guess is that they would because they're depending on um, a gradual warming. Um, but I will say that they don't, need necessarily a cold period and that is something that um, researchers are looking at right now um, because we have had reports where um, it might be on some firewood that people bring into their home and then they notice a couple of nymphs coming out. You won't get a hundred percent hatch but you will get some of them to hatch out if you move them into a warm area. Um, but the good news is there's nothing for them to feed on. And these particular insects need to feed constantly. So if they don't have a feeding source, they're going to die. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, well, that looks like that covers um, our, whoops. Oh, here's somebody. Uh, how big are they? That's a good point. I didn't, I guess we didn't have a good, do a good job of showing it. What, some of the, any of these photos to scale about how big are these things? Well, um, I'll let you know that when you see the nymphs, the ones that hatch, they're going to be the black and white ones. And many people refer to them like ticks. So if you think about a deer tick, um, it's going to look, be about that small, but they move very, very fast. Deer ticks do not move fast. A spotted lanternfly nymph will. And then they gradually go up uh, in size from there. The fourth instar that is the red with black and white. It's probably about the size of uh, the tip of your pinky. And then the adult is going to be about an inch and a half long. And then the uh, wingspan is probably about two inches on that. Okay. So maybe like the size of like a, uh, one of, like a, a knuckle of your thumb or something like that. Yeah. Cool. Wow. All right. Um, well, that uh, covers it for the questions, it looks like. Um, and if... Uh, if we do have further questions, um, you can go ahead and, uh, send those to me at marketing at instructiontech.net 
and I will direct your questions to the right person. Um, we did actually get a question about what's the cost of the ITI training. Uh, the cost is, I think it's about, I, I want to say $3 or less per seat. It's really, really inexpensive. Um, it might actually be substantially less than that. Um, depending on how many people you're putting through it, uh, it, um, we, uh, provide, uh, you know, volume discounts and things like that. The other thing too is, you know, if you have operations on, you know, out here on the West Coast, chances are probably not all those people need to be part of it. But the spotted lanternfly has been found as far east as Ohio, or I'm sorry, far west as Ohio. Is that is that right, Dana? There was a dead body that was found. Yes. No oh, goodness. All right. So um, important to uh, look at that. So. Um, uh, anyway, so point being, if you have uh, follow-up questions that you would like to ask, um, you can go ahead and send those to me, and I will uh, send those along to uh, the appropriate person. And uh, if you have uh, more questions about training, you can obviously visit our website at instructiontech.net, and then uh, that page that I showed earlier, instructiontech.net slash lanternfly, will take you to a page that we set up um, with a lot of information about um, how the permitting process works and, and information about the spotted lanternfly as it relates to the trucking industry. So um, with that, our, Dana, thank you so much for taking time today to, to talk to everybody. I know you've, you've gotten a real um, heavy duty introduction to the trucking industry here in the last year or so. Um, I hope everybody's uh, been kind and gentle with you, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to uh, talk to us about this. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity, and yes, everyone I have met um, has been very willing to answer my questions, and I certainly appreciate that. And I also just want to mention that um, you know it is a great partnership that we have trying to find the solutions for Spotted Lantern Fly with USDA. Um, several state departments of ag, um, Penn State University, Cornell, Rutgers, and Virginia Tech. So a lot of people working to find solutions, uh, just like the question that was asked about food uh, safe products. That is something the researchers are looking at as well. Um, but if you have other questions like that, stuff that needs to be on my radar, please email Tom so that uh, those things can get to me. Okay, that's great. Well. Uh Thank you again so much, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let everybody free. Uh, we, nice, actually made it under an hour. So uh, that's a rare thing, usually when I'm involved. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we will uh, be in touch with our next webinar. And uh, please holler if uh, we can help you with uh, any of your training. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye-bye.